over one third of agencies frequently struggle with over-servicing clients. Have you felt the pain? Projects are going well out of scope, things are taking longer than your team planned, and it's all having an impact on your agency's profitability. Allison Caffrey, founder and COO of Operations Agency, has identified the five biggest scoping mistakes across dozens and dozens of agencies that are often leading to over-servicing and ultimately poor profit margins. Allison has been referred to by her agency owner clients as the container store consultant for agencies, helping them get organized so that they can really become more profitable. In today's conversation, you'll learn what those five common mistakes are, how to spot and avoid them to improve your agency's performance and profit, plus a talk track for managing revision requests that'll make your team and your clients much happier. Because what is agency life without those additional client demands, am I right? As we dive in today, let's hear a recent story from Allison as she shares about an agency owner that made a 60% swing in their project profitability. Yeah, I said 60%. By addressing some of these key areas we talk about in today's episode. The client that we worked with last year, um, he owned a small uh, boutique SEO agency, and they specifically worked within uh, the health food um, industry. And they were nice and niche down. They had a lot of good repeat business. And he was like, I don't understand why my team always feels so hectic and why everything feels really last minute and why the profitability of our projects aren't coming in the way that I'm wanting to, even though, you know, I feel like I've done all the things I need to do. And we got in, we took a look at his projects, We took a look at some of the mistakes that we're going to cover today, and we realized he was 30% overutilized on his services, which means he was actually losing money hand over fist in his services and with great intentions and really wanted to knock it out of the park for his customers, which I think we all really want in a service-based business, right? We want to under-promise and over-deliver. But sometimes our over-delivery muscle gets flexed too far in the wrong direction, right? Uh, So with this, uh, you know, we really worked with this agency owner to kind of ratchet things back a little bit, create some sustainability and some visibility, right? Some some transparency in the business. And it really did support him trending in the right direction, having some of those conversations internally with his team, having those conversations with the clients and righting that wrong of, you know, really correcting his profit margins. And he's able to move that 60 percent in the right direction, right? 30 to come in and be breaking even and then 30 to kind of pull back. So this has a huge impact on how much money you're able to take home in your agency, how much money you're able to reinvest in the agency and just overall peaceful and predictable company, right? You know, being able to hedge out a little bit farther in advance and be a few steps ahead of your projects instead of just kind of reacting and figuring out how to make it work day to day. Being a few steps ahead, I think that is the goal for so many agency leaders and operations leaders who are listening to this. That 60% swing is really encouraging, and I want people to keep that in mind as the conversation goes today. We're going to be getting into the five biggest scoping mistakes that agencies often make, how to spot what they are, obviously, how to spot them, and how you can avoid them or deal with them if you are finding them in your agency. And what you just said there, Allison, I think makes a ton of sense. You had an agency owner who the that over-delivering muscle had just gotten flexed a little bit too much. You know, in 35 plus episodes of this show here on Agency Life, one of the common answers to one of our rapid fire round questions in what's the best part about agency life, the number one answer had been the people. And I hear agency owners and leaders talk about that in reference to their team, but also to their clients that they truly care about, that they've gotten to know, that they know their birthdays and their work anniversaries. And there's a little bit of that of truly wanting to over deliver in a good way that can lead to some of these problems that actually impact your profitability. And I guess before we move on, maybe that's one question here, Allison, what is this connection between over servicing the scoping mistakes and profitability that you see in the agencies that you're working with? Yeah. So operationally speaking, I always say that I come right before profitability, right? If we're streamlining things behind the scenes, making them less hectic, making sure we're a few steps ahead of our clients, you can't decouple uh, profitability from consistency or transparency, right? If you can get things to be really consistent, you can start to adjust and you can start to move in the direction of becoming more predictable, right? That's really what we want. We want predictability and profitability will come. If we understand what's coming down the pike, we can get a really solid cadence together. Um, I find that my clients who have predictable businesses also have really profitable ones. And it's hard work, right? Because we all want to skip right to the profits. 
But sometimes what happens is we really need to get in and fundamentally understand how we are doing things before we can reap the rewards of being able to have a profitable company that we can confidently reinvest into. I am a sucker for alliteration. So I love that you just dropped that predictability leads to profitability. You can't really decouple those. And as we get into our five biggest scoping mistakes, one thing I want people to keep in mind is this concept you and I have talked about before, Allison, is operational transparency. What is that concept and how does it benefit agencies in particular? And how can people kind of be listening for this theme as we talk about the five biggest scoping mistakes you see? Yeah, so this affects profitability like we've been talking about, but operational transparency to me means that there are no guesses, right? There are no surprises, right? We're in a position where we can predictably, confidently tell what's going to happen next, and so can our team. So if you're managing a team, we all know that we don't live on islands as agency owners. This is going to help the way that your team can actually come into the fold on projects and help you actually manage things to completion and, you know, knock it out of the park for your people. So operational transparency is really the guiding principle around how we want to set things up behind the scenes so that, um, and I love when my clients use, instead of the get hit by a bus analogy, they use the win the lottery analogy. Um, so when somebody on the team wins the lottery, right, and we're going through some of these things um, around setting up client projects or, you know, handling revisions, right, let's make sure that that's transparent how we do that and when we do that so that anybody on the team can step in and confidently support this and so our clients also understand what's expected of them because that relationship, especially in the service-based business, is so important to get right. And I ultimately find that clients that get this right, right, agencies that really put in the work, they develop the operational transparency, they have a trained team behind the scenes and a client base who understands what they need from them, retention rates soar. And you can't always decouple profitability from retention rates either, I'll say that. <laughs> Those are two things that are inextricably linked. <laughs> yes. That is absolutely certain, Allison. I was part of an agency where at one point, you know, new business was just flying through the roof. The numbers were off the charts. And yet we were struggling with what we call the leaky bucket. You know, we were just adding yep. more and adding more and pouring more in. But our churn rates were just, you know, unmanageable. And so that turned into a, a focus. We actually made a rallying cry of churn sucks for a full quarter. But um, I digress a bit. I I, I have an, a, an inkling that revisions are going to be on your list of top five, because as you said that, I could just, you know, I was kind of grimacing a little bit myself, and I'm sure some of our listeners were as well. So with that, let's dive into the five biggest scoping mistakes. First, tell us what these five are, and then let's dive into each one in turn, how to identify it and how to avoid it or deal with it if it's something that you're recognizing as a symptom of over-servicing already in your agency today. Yeah, totally. So the five big mistakes at a high level, first and foremost, are estimation. Second is onboarding. Third is project set up. Fourth is project maintenance. And fifth is revisions. And a lot of these, again, universally true. Almost mm -hmm. every agency I work with has some form of symptom within the five that they're currently experiencing. And you might start seeing this as proverbial scope creep, right? Over-servicing, like we're calling it, right? You start to feel like projects are behind, deadlines aren't being met. Um, if you feel like you're burning the midnight oil, so if you are an agency owner who's staying up till 2, 3 o'clock in the morning to service these accounts, right, you might be over-servicing or you might be in a position where your people don't really understand what's coming down the pike. So that is another big symptom. And of course, lack of profitability on your projects. So those are some of the symptoms, you know, high level that could be any one of the five. And mm -hmm. we'll talk about some of the more specifics as we dive into each one. All right. Let's talk about estimating because I think that this is obviously a point of friction in any agency or service-based business, um, whether it's an existing client you're generating an estimate for, or it's coming from the sales team to the client services team. Um, what have we scoped out? What have we estimated? Um, what have we planned and what have we sold? You know, if all those things don't line up, there can be a lot of friction between our team and the client. There can be friction internally between teams. So tell us a little bit about where this often goes sideways, how it leads to over-servicing, and what our listeners can actually do about it, most importantly, Allison. Yeah, totally. So I always like to start with the projects themselves. So look at your past clients. Make sure that you have a really clear understanding of what people are hiring you for, what the current scope of your past, let's just say seven or eight projects have looked like. 
and really get a clear understanding of how many hours your team has spent on those things, what the common cost per hour is of all of your teammates combined, and to make sure that we have a very clear list of deliverables on what exactly we are providing. Because I find that even agencies who have with best of intentions, you know, value pricing and they have, you know, Mm -hmm. um, flat flat rate pricing or they're doing, you know, website builds for a, a flat rate. They really don't actually understand all the things that are involved in order to estimate. And so what they're doing is they're bringing inconsistency into their deliverables, their timelines, their profit margins by doing that flat rate pricing. Unless it truly is productized, estimating with flat rate pricing is going to be a challenge, um, you know, for some digital agencies. Some get it really right, right? They productize and they understand that these things are involved, these things aren't. But going back through and understand what's involved in our projects that we currently deliver, what is the hourly involvement of those? And really creating some visibility around, obviously, the billable rate at your company, right? Because Mm -hmm. I think if we can understand that this is going to take our team 50 hours to complete, then we know our billable rate is $150, $200 an hour. We can start to estimate a little bit more accurately. Um, Our mutual friend, Marcel, says he want to, you know, really aim for um, 70% gross profit on the project, Mm -hmm. um, you know, somewhere in there. So work backwards from that as well. Um, He's been a huge advisor and and someone I frequently send business to when, you know, a client of mine is like, hey, I'm really trying to dive into this. Um, Estimation, I always think the funny uh, thing that pops into my mind is that scene in Happy Gilmore when uh, Adam Sandler and Bob Barker get into a fist fight and he's like, the price is wrong. It is wrong. And in this case, it's very wrong because it kicks things off in in a negative direction from the start. And it really informs the second mistake, which we'll talk about in a second with the sales to fulfillment handoff. So much good stuff there, including a happy Gilmore <laughs> reference that I didn't know we were going to work into today's episode on agency life. But um, I, for those who are thinking about, you know, project profit and utilization, we actually just had Marcel on uh, our monthly webinar series, uh, and we talked about the connection between utilization rates, some confusion around that, and how those tie into profitability as well. So after you check out this full conversation with Allison and I, I'll link to the webinar in the description of this episode so you can check that out as well. Marcel from Parakeeto, uh is uh, just a phenomenal mind when it comes to agency profitability. In that webinar, we actually, speaking of tangents, got into a little uh, name uh, <laughs> contest and naming the parakeeto parakeet that was behind Marcel during the <laughs> recording. So if you check That's that funny. out, uh, find that in the webinar. All right. Onboarding. This is another one in a previous episode. We were actually talking all about how to reduce client churn, talking about mm-hmm. that retention point that's so critical that you brought up earlier, Allison. And we ended up talking about the sales process and onboarding more than we talked about you know, after that re- that uh, customer health score goes red or however you track that within your agency, mm-hmm. um, onboarding can have a, a huge impact on churn. Um, it can also have a huge impact on even before churn, the predictability and the over-servicing, uh, the over-delivering as we're talking about it. So talk to us about onboarding when it comes to really over-servicing today, Allison. Yeah, I think a lot of folks believe, and to a certain degree it's true, but a lot of folks believe that trust is established in the sales process. And I think there is a a little bit of trust that needs to transpire within, you know, us, you know, doing discovery and doing the proposal or however your sales process works. But I think trust is really built in onboarding. That's my opinion, right? You get the keys and you get in behind the scenes. You're like, okay, I've made my first payment or I've, I've decided to invest in this. And the next things that happen in the next 30 days are very, very important. And so onboarding to me is kind of like when you ask your client to sit down in the audience of a play, right? They're sitting there in the audience and what happens in front of the curtain, you know, that they see that they're experiencing as part of the show is your forward-facing onboarding process. And then what happens behind the scenes, right? All the stage setup, the lighting cues, the music cues, all of that is what goes into your onboarding process behind the scenes. And so really framing out your onboarding to understand what goes in behind the scenes for my team and what is my client experiencing. You can obviously use this exact same method throughout your entire client experience, and I really encourage it. But consider that the onboarding process is your very first impression to show your client, I'm in the right place. You're going to get me the results that, you know, you promised me in the sales process. And everybody is here to support me, right? They're here to make sure that I have an incredible experience. We really want to set this off, you know, on the right foot. I've seen onboarding processes take sometimes four, five, six weeks to get all the client assets in place, and that will drain a project's resources so, so, so quickly 
And you guys will then, even with the best intentions and the best laid out project, you will now be four to six weeks behind on your originally scoped out project. And that is so demoralizing, both to the team internally who's supporting you and to your client who's really placed a lot of trust in the process to get the result that was promised. The trust cannot be overstated there. I think that it really is critical in the onboarding. It's something that I learned actually as I took over a client experience within an agency. One of the first books I read was How to Never Lose a Customer Again by Joey Coleman. If you haven't checked out that book, May, I think we've mentioned it on the show before. If not, we will definitely link it in the description here. Because one of the things I learned from that from that book is that the moment that we're ringing the gong and we're celebrating, we're high-fiving and we're putting gifts on Slack about that new logo that we just closed and we're excited to put it on the website and add it to our agency's portfolio is the moment that our agency is asking the questions you just mentioned there. Can I, can I trust this process? Did I make the right decision? Are mm -hmm. they going to get me the results? And you bring up something there being four to six weeks behind if your onboarding isn't really buttoned up, you're, you're doing all the things, but if you're not doing them efficiently, one, you're behind and two, you're, you're um, extending that time to value, right? Even if the, mm -hmm. even if the client does feel like this is okay, you're extending that time to value to getting results, which they're kind of sitting there, you know, you know, biting their nails figuratively waiting for those results. Do you think that's fair to add on to this conversation around trust and onboarding, Allison? Oh, absolutely. And I think shortcutting the first result or not shortcutting the first result, that was a, a poor way to phrase that. Um, shortcutting the time it takes for the first result, right? The first win that the client can truly mm -hmm. celebrate, whether yeah. that's having a digital landscape of some kind, right? If you're building pages or if you're building, um, you know, a web property in any, you know, capacity, uh, you're getting them their first leads or their first visibility. You know, it's really, really important to make sure that we can celebrate a micro win inside of the onboarding process. It's part of uh, one of the biggest frameworks I teach my clients called the four phase onboarding blueprint. And one of the biggest things we do is we're like, make sure that there's a win in the first 30 days that we can all rally behind and build that into your onboarding process. Make sure your team knows about it. Make sure they understand it. It can help you close deals even more confidently, right? Hey, listen, our onboarding is so buttoned up that we guarantee that you'll get this, you know, exact result within the mm -hmm. first 30 days. I think it's a, a massive confidence builder. And, you know, something to, you know, really think about as you're onboarding, if this is a symptom for you and you're like, man, we just can never seem to get onboarding right. Um, I personally advise a lot of our agencies, and we actually do this with our clients, is we put an onboarding call in place that is for no other purpose than to just make sure and gather assets. We're like, listen, if we're struggling, there's this big bucket, right, called our onboarding call. And we get on, we build rapport, we establish trust, and we say, hey, listen, I know it's really challenging to find the time. But perhaps this meeting can be a forcing function where we can just go through any questions that you have on the agreement, make sure that you gave, gave us all your digital assets, make sure that you filled out your intake form, right? We all know we bird dog about intake forms 900 times every single week that aren't being filled out. And I think with the best intentions, we have these onboarding processes, but it's helpful to add those little acceleration points, right? Get your, you know, get your clients excited, get them a quick win, get them on the phone with you, right? Really add that personal touch that's going to make sure that you're laying a comfortable foundation on which to grow a really fruitful relationship. Yeah. Allison, I'd love to put you on the spot and ask you if there's any examples or maybe um, fun um, ways that this, act, you've seen this come to light, celebrating those micro wins. You said, like, if you're consulting with an agency and you're like, you need to accelerate, you need to shortcut the time to that first client win and find something that you know you can deliver. I like what you said there and you guys do with your clients in, you know, a win can be, okay, we checked off this milestone. I don't have to hound you. You've seen my face. You've heard my voice. Those sorts of things mm -hmm. are kind of emotional wins. But maybe what's an example of a tactical win, a, a micro win, as you called it, that folks could think about, hey, we know we're going to accomplish this. How do we, mm -hmm. how do we kind of uh, work back into that and guarantee that we hit that in 15 days with a new client. Any examples come to mind for you? Yeah, totally. We were working with um, an agency that specialized in like YouTube production and growing YouTube channels. And they were like, oh, this person has a channel already. Usually the people we work with do. We're going to go in and overhaul all their keywords and update all their thumbnails. And they were like, we can actually do that for pretty cheaply. I was like, great. Mm -hmm. Let them know that that's a deliverable in the service, but don't let them know it's going to happen in the first two weeks. Just ping them and be like, hey, listen, I'm so excited for this project. Just so you know, we actually just took the liberty of going in and updating everything on your channel. Hopefully now things will jump up, you know, in search and here's how that impacted you. 
And it was an, a completely unexpected. So if you can add the element of surprise in there, I would do that. Okay. Or you can obviously highlight it as a guarantee in your onboarding process. Say, hey, listen, within the first 14 mm -hmm. days of working with me, you're going to have more highly ranking organic YouTube content, period. Mm -hmm. That's going to happen. And here's how we do that. So that's an excellent micro in, especially because they've already done so much work, right? A lot of the clients mm -hmm. that we're working with, it's often that they have old websites that we can just quickly do a couple things to while we're building the other thing behind the curtain mm -hmm. over here. We can just come in and optimize it a little bit, or we can go through their channel, or we can judge up their social media. And judge is a technical word, I promise. Um, you can, you know, you can really help them with that quick micro win. And just think about it like your your clients already have these habits that exist inside of their business and inside mm -hmm. of their life. If you can come in and make one small tweak, mm -hmm. right, to their form, to their Mm -hmm. their content that they're sharing, it'll be really impactful for them. And it'll really establish that trust. You know, that touches on something we've been seeing in a lot of market research we've been doing here at teamwork.com, looking at the agencies and the professional service firms that we serve. Oftentimes we've been looking at the value that they see in kind of the long term, the, the profitability, the scaling their agency or their firm. And what we're finding is oftentimes they're a little bit more focused on the here and now, solve this problem, make this a little bit easier, because then if I can do that, then I can start building towards the long term. And I hear you advising the same thing for the agencies who are listening to this to think about for their customers. They, are, they have those big ambitious goals, right? But if you can solve something for them on a Tuesday that saves them an hour or allows them to take a great update back to their boss and say, look what this agency just did for us before we even you know, had our onboarding call or our first QBR or any of those things, then you can impact their micro day to day, which is actually going to give an emotional win and actual tactical win. So I think that YouTube example was fantastic. If you're listening to this, you might want to hit that back button and hear Allison that. laid out two ways you could do it. You could, um, you could use it in the sales process as a guarantee, which gives you some credibility to win the deal, or you can use it as surprise and delight which is going to help you with uh, reducing churn. I think either way could be applicable for your agency. So discuss that with your team and find a way to work those in. All right, so number one was estimating. Number two was onboarding in our biggest scoping mistakes that most agencies are guilty of, for lack of a better term. Number three, I think you said was project setup. Am I right there, Allison? Yeah, that's right. And it's kind of traditionally termed as resource planning, right? We win yep. a project. We want to make sure that it goes to the right people on the right, um, you know, teams that have the right skill set to perform the right type of work. And at the end of the day, if we don't have transparency or visibility into who can do which types of tasks or perform which types of strategies or media buying initiatives or lead those behind the scenes, it's going to be really tough for us to set up the project. And I find that project setup is mildly inconsistent um, among a lot of the agencies that I've worked with, meaning that they have some projects in some tools or they have one tool set up and the project setup itself is done by several different account managers and they don't all look uniform and they don't all have the same milestones and the same cadence. And so nailing project setup, it's going to be the biggest migratory effort that you have. You know, you can create some templates in whatever tool that you're using and make sure that you have a really solid setup process and understand the skill set of the people on your team, right? I think estimation is really excellent to go back and take a look at what are the past projects that we've done, how long, you know, you know, transparently has this taken us to actually fulfill on. And then inside of the project setup, you're really future casting, right? You're resource planning to say, okay, if we estimated correctly, here's exactly how we're going to set up our project. And here are the key players on our team who are going to be assigned to this account, right? You assign an account manager. So that assignment process, making sure that that's really clear behind the scenes for your team. If you have a tiered account management structure, that's even more important. Who's the strategist? Who's the manager? Who's the admin? You know, really making sure that that is lined out and super clear is going to set the project up for success because what hopefully won't happen if you set this up well is that things won't slip through the cracks because we have an accountable party for every moving piece of the project. I love that. And one of the things that it brings to mind is you just mentioned templates, right? And it surprises me so often as I hear from our sales team and our CSMs and account managers here at teamwork.com as they're working with uh, prospective customers or existing customers here. And they're like, hey, how often are you using templates? And we find that man, there's still more opportunity for them to have that repeatability and going back to a word we used earlier, predictability in their project setup just by leveraging templates 
um, yes. in whatever tool, if, whether that's teamwork.com or another one. Another uh, resource I'll mention, if you're listening to this and resource management is a particular pain point for you, we recently had uh, Hannah Taylor from Interactive Strategies, a digital agency of, I want to say probably 70, 75 people. They're achieving some scale. And so they've actually leveraged teamwork.com very, very well. I was, uh, I love to see the way that they've leveraged the platform to, uh, to optimize their resource planning and their capacity management. We'll link to that webinar here as well. There's tons of resources for you in today's episode description is the point that I want to get across. <laughs> All right, Allison, project setup is number three, but then number four, I think where things often go off the rails is project maintenance. Even if you do have those templates, you've scoped it out well, um, mm -hmm. you've got a plan. What's the old saying? Everyone has a plan before they get punched in the mouth of Mike Tyson, <laughs> something like that, right? Hey, that is so good. Um, so I don't think I've heard that one, but I'm totally going to look it up after we get off because I love me a good Mike Tyson quote. Um, but truly, I know so many agencies and so many business owners at large, right? Let's just say this, that we have really, really great intentions and we prepare, you know, the best project management system or the best template or the shiniest SOP. And I work a lot in knowledge management as well. But then it collects dust. Nobody looks at it. Nobody updates it. And that's why maintenance I've added, because I could say the four biggest scoping mistakes that you make, but I say the five, because maintenance to me is so important. We have to make sure that we're updating the project. Things are going to happen outside of the original scope that we'd had. Things are absolutely going to come in. And I think it's really foolish of some, you know, business owners and, and folks to just think that, okay, everything's going to go exactly the way that we planned. And if we set up the project and all the dates are going to stay the same and everybody's going to get their stuff done on time and nobody's going to need a quick ping about this other thing that maybe might have fallen through the cracks. And so setting up maintenance procedures around your projects is going to be huge. They should be time bound. So we should be in a position where it's either once a week, twice a week, whatever your cadence looks like that we're going into projects and whoever's accountable to that needs to understand um, that they're going in, they're looking at deadlines, they're looking at due dates, they're looking at the actual scope itself, making sure that we didn't get any random emails about adding the cookie footer at the bottom of the page or whatever, right? Like making sure that we have all the little details lined out and maintaining that over time. So if you guys aren't doing, um, you know, if, if you're an agency owner listening and you're not doing internal, you know, project meetings or anything like that, um, it's really, really helpful to even just set an internal project meeting where we can just go over all of the projects behind the scenes and be like, great, is this trending the way that we want to? Is this, you know, accurate in terms of the current list of items that we have open for this client, especially as you move into retainer based work? A lot of my agency owners will knock it out of the park when they start to do their projects. And then when they move to retainer, sometimes that gets a little bit fumbled because it's more of a maintenance practice, right? really consistently checking in, making sure that things are updated and not just kind of standing there with a big bucket and reacting to all the things that your client wants to send you, right? So I think it's really, really, this is probably one of the most challenging ones, I would say, um, is being able to stay consistent and get those healthy habits developed around project management. Um, assign an owner to this um, per project if you can. Um, but if you have one project manager, if you're a smaller agency, make sure that they understand, hey, listen, you are the one. You're the key, the person with the keys to the kingdom. You're updating all the projects and making sure that all the trains are on time and that we are putting our best foot forward when it comes to serving clients. I love that last point because as the saying goes, we're going to bring in another movie quote. We've done uh, Happy Gilmore. We've got a Mike Tyson quote. And now I'm going to bring in Disney Pixar Incredibles. You know, when Ooh. Syndrome says when everyone's special, then, no, or he says, when everyone's super, then no one is, right? Yep. If everyone owns it, then no one does, right? Yep. It, it, exactly what you said there. Who is the clear owner of this maintenance part of the project, especially if you have, you know, an ongoing flat fee or retainer-based model, you can't just sit back and react because that's where client churn is going to creep up and you're going to yep. have what I call kind of that silent churn waiting to happen because you're just being reactive, you're just coming there. And it ties into what you said earlier about operational transparency. So let's say that you set up the project really, really well. You're nailing number three, right? You've got transparency. People know the timelines. People know who's doing what and who owns it. Not everyone, as we're saying here. And the <laughs> client knows everything. But that doesn't mean that you have operational transparency around what happens when things go wrong, because they will. It's mm -hmm. not if, right? And so how do you coach agencies, Allison, on some some maybe low-hanging fruit, some best practices on 
make sure that you have this sort of check-in or this sort of cadence when it comes to project maintenance. Yeah, love that question because my number one answer to a lot of companies, uh, you know, agencies, churn problems um, is proactive communication, right? Our clients, I think we all understand that growing a business, launching a new marketing campaign, being a parent, right? It's not all going to be rainbows and daisies, right? We want to establish trust and know that the person that we've brought on to help us with this is actually in our corner and actually invested in our success, right? And we want to know that they are one or two steps ahead of us, and we need to be reminded on what those next steps are. And so creating a proactive communication schedule is kind of like when you're climbing Everest, you need to hire the Sherpa. (laughs) The Sherpa brings you up, and he's a couple steps ahead of you. He's been there before. He understands what's happening. So if you're connecting with your clients, for us at Operations Agency, our private clients get two to four touch points every single week from our team. And that's proactive. Some of it might be reactive if they send us, you know, a note or something like that and they have a quick question for us or something. But for the most part, completely proactive. And the reason that we do that is because we want to make sure that they understand that they're top of mind, right? Hey, listen, it's Monday morning. I'm going to touch base with all my clients and let them know, hey, this is what we're working on for you guys this week. If you have any questions, just let me know. And then on Thursdays, we do the wrap up. We're saying, hey, listen, You know that email I said on Monday, we're going to do all this stuff. It's done now. And here's all the work. And here's the type of feedback I need from you. And so if you're being proactive there, they don't need to follow up with you and be like, hey, where was that sales page? Y'all said you were going to wireframe out for me. Or where's the campaign that we talked about, you know, two weeks ago? Even though it could take two weeks to make it, right, you're on time behind the scenes. You got to give those little flags of progress to your um, to your clients, especially because A lot of times agency owners work with people who do not understand web property. They do not understand digital marketing. They do not understand any of the digital landscape. I have clients all the time. They work with, you know, home service providers. I mean, they have no idea except that their phone rings and there's a prospect on the other end. And so we need to help answer some of those questions about progress because they can't read between the lines of what we are doing and understand the turnaround. That's a really good point. And it's something that uh, when I was training an account management team, this is a little bit different than just proactive communication, but it 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 does tie into not letting those length of time go from the time that the customer or the client has heard from you to when you get back to them. Oftentimes I saw junior account managers get a question from a client that was tough. They needed to go get some data. They needed to get approval if they could do something more because it was an out of scope request maybe or something like that. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I tried to train that team on was there's a difference between an initial reply and a complete response, right? The tendency can be like, I got this question from the client. I need to go figure it out. And maybe it takes me a week to, to respond and give the answer, right? That doesn't mean that you don't give that reply and you give the estimation of how long it's going to take you for that full response. That Mm two-step process can make or break everything. Because if they go two weeks without hearing from you, then you're going to get that nasty gram, you know, day 13 or whatever. Why haven't I heard back on this? Da, 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 da. But if you send that email right away, two hours later and say, look, I, I understand this. This is what I need to figure out. This is who I need to talk to. And this is when you can expect to hear back from me. And by the way, if you beat that and you under promise over deliver and you beat that by a couple of days and yes. set yourself up for that, then they're going to be happy with a two-week response, right? But it's that reply in the middle, and it's those other touch points. Different kind of application, but same sort of thing I hear in kind of the the ethos or the premise that you're talking about there, Allison. Well, I'm excited to get to number five on this list because revisions, I think, are just, you know, it can feel like death by a thousand paper cuts for mm-hmm. agency owners, whether you're, uh, or frontline folks, project managers, account managers. Um, we alluded to this earlier, talk to us a little bit about revisions, where that comes into over-servicing and what the heck we can do about it. Yeah. Revisions are the bane of a lot of our agency owners' existence, especially our creative agencies, right? Where you're dealing with design Mm -hmm. assets or UXD and all these types of things. It's really, really challenging to navigate the landscape of revisions. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes when I work with design agencies and I ask them about this, they say, yeah, we work with revisions and it's just part of being a digital agency or a creative agency, right? It's just part of what we do. And oftentimes there is no plan in place for revisions and they can really derail a project. I find that the companies I work with that start with revisions and get some, you know, you know, bumpers, right? Think of the bowling lanes that we used when we were little kids, right? Get some bumpers 
on how this kind of moves down the pike is going to be really, really helpful to making sure that this goes well. Often when we have revisions from clients, right, we'll ship them work and then we'll say, let me know what you think. No, 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 no. I hate that line. I hate that line so much. Let me know what you think. It's like, okay, I personally, if I got lobbed that question, let me know what you think. I'll be like, um, you mean about the weather, current state of the union, your web de- a- asset that you just gave me? Like, what exactly would you like me to share my thoughts on? And so I say this to be cheeky and not to point fingers at all, but let me know what you think is a little too open-ended. Like we talked about just a minute ago, Logan, a lot of the clients that we have do not understand digital landscape. They are not creative designers. That's why they've hired us. And so part of being that Sherpa, being that lead for them, really being their trusted advisor and also the deliverer of results, we need to help guide them on what types of feedback are going to be most helpful to move the project forward. Mm -hmm. Things like, do you like the the font with the hard lines or do you like the font with the curved lines, right? Mm -hmm. That simple thing, I think, would help just direct some of the feedback. And it also, I think, is very, very helpful to establish the production turnaround on revisions. For example, right? So you give somebody, you know, the direction on what specifically to look for. Do you like the warm colors or the cool colors? Do you like the soft lines or the or the hard lines? It's also helpful to say, and listen, I'm gonna leave this with you for the next two days. I really do need to have some, you know, some thought on this. And so you can even give them a rubric similar to, you know, and this is maybe a bonus tip. But when you're asking for, you know, client testimonial or a client case study, give them the rubric through which you expect them to share about their experience with you. Same is true with revisions or design input, right? You want to give them the rubric and say, I'm going to leave this with you for two days. I'll need it back by then so I can execute on your changes to keep things moving forward, right? Let them know how many they get. Let them know what the timeline looks like. And I promise this is something that has been probably one of the most instrumental um, elements of upgrading your project management experience and just not over delivering is being able to set those boundaries and those um, guidelines around revisions. Ask them Mm -hmm. what exactly you're looking for and make sure they understand the turnaround time and its effects on the project. Mm -hmm. And ask them who else needs to give input, right? Because oftentimes uh, I saw this, speaking of revisions, one of the areas that this came up in the podcast production agency I was a part of was in design, in designing cover art. And that was one of those areas where we would present You know, we would do a mood board and then we would present three cover art options and we would say, let me know what you think. And what that opened up uh, the options for is, like you said, what do you want me to let you know about? But even if you do, how do you want me to like, what is fair game here? Can I say start over? Can I say I don't like any of these? Right. And if they say that all of a sudden you're thinking, oh, no, now we need to have another mood board call. That's going to back us up a week, and then that's going to back us up another week. And what if the CEO comes in and vetoes the cover art at the last minute? So Mm -hmm. letting them know this is the number of revisions, this is the turnaround time, um, you know, and those questions of which of these three do you like and why Mm -hmm. do you like them? And those even more specific questions, the colors, the fonts, those sorts of things in telling them how to give you feedback. And letting them know that if they give feedback outside of that, here's what it's going to do to our overall project timeline. Uh, Because if they know that up front versus hearing it two weeks later, man, it can just totally derail things. I I saw you sigh there. So I imagine you have something to say on that. (laughs) Yes. It's funny because um, we've never built um, a home transparently, but we have significantly rehabbed a home. And there were so many times where we'd pushed the timeline back. But we made the decision because it was important for us to maintain the structural integrity of what we were doing. So let your clients decide, but let them decide confidently, right? Say, hey, listen, if we really want to go back to the drawing board on this mood board, here's what it's going to do to the project. I want to make sure that you have full decision authority and autonomy over what we're creating together. So I'm just going to let you know that this is what's going to happen. And oftentimes our clients, just with that transparency, right, just with the understanding and you're in the foxhole with them. They can give the thumbs up and then everybody's on the same page. So even if the project does, you know, go behind by two weeks, they understand and everybody's in agreement that it is the best move forward for the branding play or for the, you know, the web design or whatever it is you guys are working on together. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes that speed might not be the most important thing for the client, right? The structural (laughs) integrity, the brand integrity. You know, to take the the marketing to the home building analogy a little bit further, but if they feel like they they helped make that decision and they knew the implications of that decision beforehand, 
they're going to be far less upset and they're going to feel like, like you said, you're, they're in the foxhole with you. Man, if you're listening to this, hit that back button a couple times. Um, I would transcribe what Allison just said and save that for your account managers um, to start using this week um, when you're working with clients when it comes to this area of revisions. Um, anything else you want to add on revisions before we move further down the conversation, Allison? No, you know, and I know they're hard. I just want to yeah. say that, right? It's challenging and it's going to be an ever evolving process, right? You're going to do this next round, hopefully better after listening to this episode. Mm -hmm. And then after that, all you can really do is get better incrementally over time. Um, that's kind of the big theme of operations, right? At an agency is you want to make sure to establish those three ways and, and create great systems, but it's an overtime process, right? You don't, mm -hmm. you know, work really hard to get a six pack. And then as soon as you're done, you just stop working out, right? You got to maintain that. And you've got to keep getting better and changing up your workouts and doing some cross training. And that that's true in your agency, right? Sometimes stuff's going to suck, right? Hit workouts aren't fun. Revisions aren't fun. But they do lead to incredibly impactful results and, and create higher performance within the business and within ourselves. It goes back to what you were talking about earlier, the predictability. Revisions are going to be a part of agency life. But what we can do to tame the chaos is bring some predictability to it, have that transparency over what do we do about revisions? How many times? How do we present them? How do we work through them? How do we deal with, you know, outside of scope revision requests from clients? And having that transparency in how you do it is going to make it easier. It doesn't mean revisions are going to go away, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Allison, we've talked about the five common scoping mistakes, estimating, onboarding, project setup, project maintenance, which we touched back on in this, uh, in number five as well, and revisions. Before we get to our final two segments, as we always have here on Agency Life, our Fast Five and our, uh, our shout out time, uh, you and I have talked a little bit about the relationship and the different roles between account management and operations, especially as it comes to scope creep and over servicing. I figured it was worth just a few minutes to touch on this for folks who are thinking about these symptoms of over servicing, how to deal with them, and then how to go to their respective team members, both in account management and operations and take some of these lessons and this advice that you've given and put it into application across both those teams this week. Yeah, so this is a big a big lift for a lot of agencies, especially if you don't have an account manager, but it can um, make some great momentum with a couple simple tweaks. Um, so first and foremost, make sure that you're identifying an account manager on the team. And it might be you for now, if you're a founder um, you know, with a small team listening, you might be the account manager. But start to think about what goes into the management and maintenance of accounts, right? What types of communication you're doing and really, really hone in on who can be the person who's keeping all the trains on time. Because mm -hmm. I personally think that your greatest asset to your agency is not only just growing the business, but also doing the delivery around the things that you started your agency for in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. If you're doing high level web design, high level UXD, creative direction, whatever that looks like. You can become the account strategist instead of the account manager, mm -hmm. and that will free so many incredible things um, from you as the owner. And it will give somebody who's transparently sometimes better than the founder at doing some of the mm -hmm. management pieces, right? So jumping in, making sure <laughs> that you are giving that person the baton is going to make your agency better. And it's also going to knock it out of the park for your clients. They're going to feel mm -hmm. so supported. Yeah. Absolutely. It reminds me of some we talked uh, just a few episodes back with Kate Vasilenko. They ended up driving client results 70% faster in so many cases because they did exactly what you were talking about here. They separated out the account strategist from the project manager. So the operations and, and keeping the project maintenance on, on track, as we've been talking about, is a common mistake here. And the person uh, who is responsible for the strategy, looking at the data, updating the, the client on the results, when you can parse those two out, and maybe mm -hmm. it means getting those out of your hands as the founder, or maybe it means, you know, clearly defining roles and responsibilities if you already have a larger agency and you've got these things living in different teams. Uh, I want to, uh, if you haven't checked out any of the previous resources we've been loading up in the description already, we'll put that one in here as well, because it really gives you um, an example of exactly what Allison's talking about today in an agency that's achieving some scale and some results in that area. All right. With that being said, Allison, we're going to hit you with our fast five. You ready for our rapid fire round? Woo, I'm ready. Palms right. are sweaty. <laughs> Number one, if someone gave you an extra $10,000 a month for your agency right now, 
to help better run things, how do you think you would use that extra budget amount right now? To better run things, I would actually invest in our marketing. Um, it's actually really, really important to educate folks about operations in a way that doesn't feel so overwhelming and cumbersome. I do that to my the best of my ability right now, but right now it's kind of me. <laughs> so I'm just kind of talking about it. Um, I would love to make sure that folks feel like they have tangible resources for more things that they could improve in their business on a day-to-day -day basis. I love it. That's been a common one. When we surveyed 20 plus agency owners at Inbound in Boston HubSpot's conference in 2023, that was the number one answer is investing in marketing. So you're in good company there. All right, Allison, number two, uh, what are some of your all-time favorite books, especially for agency leaders and founders that you're recommending? Yeah, I mean, The E-Myth is a fantastic mm -hmm. uh, classic operations book. Um, I actually recently read from a coach of mine. He released his book last year. It's called Buy Back Your Time by Dan Martell. And if you're an agency owner who's really looking for a repeatable process on how to assess how you're spending your time in your agency and being able to get that off to a really um, you know, capable team, that's an excellent, excellent mm -hmm. read. Um, and I also love, since we talked quite a bit about profitability, key performance indicators, and being able to isolate some of the, um, the I guess, symptoms of, you know, challenging operations, um, it's called Straight Talk, Simple Numbers, Big Profits by Greg Crabtree. I read it earlier this year for a second time, and man, it's good. It's really, really good. So if you're wondering about, like, what you should be tracking and some of the financial stuff behind the scenes, mm -hmm. um, obviously, that is just such a, a, a massively impactful read. Oh, good one. That is a new one to our ever-growing list of book recommendations for agency <laughs> leaders. So thank you for that one. All right. Number three is my favorite as regular listeners of this show uh, often know. Allison, what's one mistake you've made in running your agency that you're never going to forget? Woo. Sometimes I can be told that I light the fire um, in a good way and in a bad way. Um, so I've really needed to work on my patience and my employee development. That is something that I think a lot of our longstanding employees, I've had a lot of great people who've been with me for a really long time. And I think some of the ways that I could have been better in some of the earlier stages of the business as I got in like a keener and was really trying to motivate in the way that I was motivating and learning some of those personality styles earlier on in agency life would have probably yielded some really incredible early on results for us. Not that we didn't have the growth trajectory that is still really amazing and exciting, um, but I, I really do think that as owners, we're always challenged by leadership development and making mm -hmm. sure that we can have those types of conversations with our team. So that's something I wish I invested in a little bit earlier. For sure. All right, we're going to round it out with four and five that are two sides to the same coin. Allison, what do you think is the hardest part about agency life? And what do you think is the best part about agency life? Ooh, hardest part about agency life, I think, is adding revenue without overhead. Um, I think a lot of agencies struggle with this, and I don't think that it's done without so much complication. Um, but a lot of us who want to deliver great results and, you know, grow our client base, and we have to kind of figure out what that means for our team behind the scenes, whether we're contracting or working with a white label agency or we're truly bringing on a full-time hire, that resource planning function, in my opinion, has been one of the biggest um, biggest challenges for the agencies I've worked with and, you know, growing my, you know, operations agency over the last six years. Um, so that's, that's really, really fun. Um, the thing I love most about agency life actually is the impact that agencies make. You look at somebody who's doing, you know, mold removal or pest inspection or, um, you know, home repairs in any capacity. They have no idea how to get themselves out there. They have no idea, you know, how to bring in more customers. And I personally feel like digital agencies make the impossible possible by making folks aware that great services, great products and things exist that actually change people's lives. So marketing agencies, I think is one of the reasons why I love working with digital agencies and creative agencies is they can bring products and services that nobody ever knew about, nobody ever understood, and they can bring them to the homes and into the lives of the consumers or the businesses that can benefit from them. So I feel like if we can keep digital agencies in business and they can continue to provide the vehicle for things that are going to change people's lives, I feel like I'm doing my part. <laughs> it reminds me of a quote from Brian Senna at Everwonder, a teamwork.com customer. I got to connect with it inbound. And he's, he said, I love this line that agencies are the mavens of business. Um, mm -hmm. You get to know all sorts of different businesses and help all sorts of different businesses. Um, and so silently behind the scenes, oftentimes having such a big impact to use the word. Uh, that you did there, Allison. I love that. 
All right. Who is someone else? And as we close it out today that you want to thank or mention that's had a big impact on your own journey in agency life? Yeah, totally. I would like to shout out my friend and client, Cody Birch. Um, He's a fellow digital agency owner and has created so many great products in his company. And he's been a trusted advisor and coach for me on my own marketing and even helped me think through, okay, as an agency owner, this is what I'm actually struggling with. This is what I'm actually dealing with. And he was instrumental in the early stages of growth in my company. And I absolutely will have a friendship (laughs) that lasts forever because of that. Um, And to this day, he advises um, on our marketing. And I've had such an incredible experience um, working with him, um, helping him with his operations and creating kind of that um, give and take relationship that I think provides such a fruitful friendship and professional relationship. I love that. Great place to round it out today. Allison, for (laughs) folks who aren't yet your good friend and want to stay connected with you, they got some value from our list of five common uh, scoping mistakes today and several of the resources that we mentioned. What's the best way for them to reach out, find more content from you and your team, or just stay connected? Yeah, absolutely. I'm super active on the socials um, and we're dropping lots of amazing content on our YouTube channel. Best way to reach out and follow us is on Instagram. So at Operations Agency, if you send me a DM, just say teamwork, I'll send you the full document and breakdown of what the five scoping um, issues are, how to fix them. And if I have a template, it's in there too. So you can just swipe and deploy some of that stuff. Um, I'm I'm not kidding. This is something that I'm so passionate about because I want to make sure agencies have better projects, have better operations. Um, But we're there all the time dropping lots of tips and things that we're doing with our clients. Um, And I'm probably most active there. So it's actually really likely that you are going to hear from me on Instagram um, and give you any uh, pointers that you need in the right direction on your operations. I love that. Go DM operations agency, Allison and her team. DM them teamwork so that they know you listen to this episode and get some additional resources that can help you with this exact problem that we've been talking about today. Allison, this has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much for joining us on Agency Life today. Thanks, Logan. I had a blast. Appreciate you having me.